20 September, almost three months after the North Korean communists launched their invasion, United Nations troops are in the first stages of their all-out drive toward North Korea. Five days previously, they went from the defensive to the offensive, when U.S. Marines made an amphibious landing 150 miles behind the enemy lines at Incheon. The landing cut off the enemy from his supplies and caught him in a giant United Nations pincers. Air Force, Navy, and Marine planes give support to ground troops and cut off communist attempts to bring up reinforcements from the north and south. Exactly three months to the day after the city of Seoul fell to the communist invaders, UN forces recapture this South Korean capital. These are Marines and U.S. 7th Division troops advancing into Seoul under enemy fire. Street fighting rages throughout the city. The Reds have fortified many of the buildings and Red tanks may appear around any corner. It had been hoped that Seoul might be recaptured with a minimum of destruction. But this is impossible, as the Reds stage a house-to-house -house fight. After a five-day battle for Seoul, General MacArthur announces the city's recapture on 26 September. There is still fighting in the city, but the main communist garrison is now fleeing to the north. UN troops rest as they close another chapter of history. At the Ashia Air Base in Japan during the battle for Seoul, the 187th Airborne Regiment arrives from the United States. Ammunition and other supplies are loaded on unit vehicles which will be flown to Korea. The paratroopers, 2400 strong, board C-54 transports and C-119 flying boxcars for their flight to the combat zone. Kimpo Airfield is the destination. The paratroopers are rushed to staging areas as fast as they unload. The same C-54s fly wounded back to Japan. In its first four days of operation, the Kimpo airlift evacuated 313 wounded to Japan. Cargo and passenger planes are coming into Kempo at a rate of one every 10 minutes. Typical cargo is this disassembled 280-ton bridge. These ponton boats are part of the bridge, which was shipped entirely by air. The airfield is inspected by Air Force leaders past and present. In the group are General George C. Kenney, Commanding General, Air University, 
Lieutenant General George C. Stratemeyer, commanding General U.S. Far East Air Forces, and General Carl Spotts, retired, former commander of the U.S. Air Force. In the background is a captured Yak fighter plane found in good condition. Now land-based at Kimpo are marine carrier planes aiding in the tactical support of ground forces north of Seoul. This F-7F Tiger Cat night fighter proves especially valuable during this stage of the fighting north of Seoul. F-7Fs are equipped with radar and are very effective against convoys and troop concentrations at night and in bad weather. These Tiger Cats and Corsairs are being loaded with 5-inch rockets for a strike near Seoul. As UN troops liberate South Korean territory, they find more and more appalling evidence of mass atrocities committed by the Reds. On 6 October, it is estimated that 25,000 South Korean men, women, and children, as well as United States soldiers taken prisoner, have been massacred by the retreating Reds. Bodies are found in many different areas, many having been killed by clubbing and burning, as well as by shooting. One of the largest mass graves is found at Tejong where 6,000 atrocity victims are uncovered. When the fighting ends in Korea, these scenes will be evidence for a war crimes investigation. typhoon hits the U.S. Sakai Army base in Japan. With rain and wind ranging up to 110 miles per hour, it is the worst storm to hit Japan in 16 years. Corrugated metal roofing flies through the air like paper. Most of the tile, shingle, and corrugated metal roofs are damaged. The concrete structures withstand the storm well, although windows are broken and there is water damage. There are no military casualties from the storm since most of the troops remain indoors in the stronger buildings, safe from the falling trees and power lines. But among the Japanese in the storm's path, 135 are killed, over a thousand injured, and over 200,000 made homeless. The heaviest military damage is suffered by wooden and tar paper buildings. These tropical storms are expected near the Sea of Japan at this time of the year. October 17 is a suspenseful day for the U.S. 1st Cavalrymen as they advance into the outskirts of Pyongyang, capital city of North Korea. 
The city is known to be heavily fortified, and it is expected that the Reds will make a death stand for their capital. It is reported that the Reds have 30,000 men defending Pyongyang. Another red is added to the 75,000 captured so far. A vehicle burns beside the road. Ammunition explodes in the fire. The attack is led by tanks as the 1st Cavalry advances under fire toward the center of the city. The railroad guides them. Then, surprisingly, the enemy fire weakens as U.S. infantrymen reach the heart of the city. The Reds are withdrawing. Although there is occasional rear guard fire and sniper activity, the main Red force has begun to flee northward in disorganization. A company medic gives first aid to a cavalryman wounded in the street fighting. As the 1st Cavalrymen overrun the city, South Korean troops join them. The ROK forces met heavy resistance on the east side of town, but finally fought their way through after six hours. They are following the retreating enemy northward. An estimated Red force of 30,000 is now fleeing Pyongyang. South Koreans and 1st Cavalrymen join forces, decide their zones of action, and move on. In the eastern area of Pyongyang, near the Tedong River, the South Koreans encounter a pocket of enemy rear guard troops and pause to wipe them out. Only small arms fire is necessary as the river is crossed by bridge and assault boats. As UN forces take over the city, the North Korean communist government has vanished, presumably having fled north across the Manchurian border. The heavily fortified capital of Korean communism is now under the United Nations flag. As UN forces take the North Korean capital at Pyongyang, a new threat to the Reds gets underway at Kimpo Airfield. Paratroopers of the 187th Airborne Regiment plan to jump ahead of the Reds fleeing Pyongyang cutting off their escape route to the border. The planes are C-47 transports and C-119 boxcars. There are over 4,000 men in this operation, which consists of two separate drops on 20 and 21 October. The destination is a point 33 miles north of Pyongyang, where the Reds are fleeing through the towns of Sukchan and Sunchan. Here they go. The paratroopers bail out in waves from a dozen planes at a time. On the ground, there is practically no opposition. The attack comes as a complete surprise. Watching the jump is General MacArthur, who flew here from Japan to observe this first airborne operation of the Korean War. Flying over the attack area in his constellation, the United Nations commander stated, this closes the trap on the enemy. Of particular interest in this drop is the parachuting of heavy equipment, vehicles and artillery. 
The equipment drop takes place 10 minutes after the personnel have landed. Most of the material lands without damage, and the paratroopers rush out to put it into action. Transportation found available on the scene is pressed into service. Although the big jump was delayed at the start by bad weather, it moves like clockwork once it gets underway. Casualties are few. Out of the 4,064 men who made the two jumps, only 90 men are listed as jump casualties, and most of these consist of broken legs and sprains. Evacuation is rapid. Specially equipped helicopters land to carry the wounded, and they are quickly on their way back to the hospital. Shortly after the paratroopers take their positions, they are joined by tanks of the 1st Cavalry Division which have pushed through from Pyongyang. As these forces join, the last remnants of the Red Army are compressed into an area only 50 miles from the Manchurian border. On 17 September at Busan Air Base, a transport plane arrives with the first big-name entertainer to visit the troops in Korea. Al Jolson, often billed as the world's greatest entertainer, is in the midst of his last road tour. A veteran of years in show business and months of entertaining troops in World War II in Europe, Africa, India, and the South Pacific, Al Jolson disregarded his doctor's warning and at the age of 64 set out to entertain troops in hospitals and at the Korean battlefront. In front of the audience he liked best, Jolson gives one of his last performances. GI audience enjoys his act. Al entertained Korean War casualties in Japan before arriving in Korea and already has used up much of the seemingly boundless energy which he put into every performance. It was impossible for Al Jolson not to give out with all his energy and all his heart. His gaiety and rhythm was infectious, and he knew it could bring joy to others. On 23 October, six days after he gave this performance, Al Jolson died from a heart attack in San Francisco. One of his last acts in Korea was to raise a United Nations flag. During the month covered by this combat bulletin, the United Nations drive into North Korea moved ahead with surprising rapidity. On 20 September, UN forces were fighting in the outskirts of Seoul, fanning south from the Incheon landing and breaking out of their old beachhead. By 5 October, Republic of Korea troops had crossed the 38th parallel and were 55 air miles beyond the imaginary border between North and South Korea. On the west, U.S. troops were meeting some resistance north of Seoul. United Nations forces, including U.S., British, and Australian troops, were regrouping, an expectation of a full-scale drive across the parallel after the United Nations voted approval for General MacArthur to send his troops into North Korea. By 20 October, communist forces were staggering, throwing off their uniforms and surrendering at the rate of 2,400 daily. The day before, Pyongyang, North Korean capital, had been captured by UN troops. Two hours after Pyongyang was declared secure, members of the 187th Airborne Regiment dropped from planes 33 miles above Pyongyang and about 75 miles from the Manchurian border. South Korean troops drove westward link up with the paratroopers. On the east coast, South Korean troops had taken Wonsan with unexpectedly light resistance and were advancing far to the north. Disintegrating communist troops were attempting to flee to the Manchurian border. There was still fighting ahead, but at this time it appeared that the Korean War was, as General MacArthur phrased it, definitely coming to an end. 